Good morning. It's nice to see you here. Uh, my name is Paul Grogan. I'm the president of the Boston Foundation. Many of you are familiar with the Boston Foundation and have been here many times. If there is anyone, however, being here for the first time this morning, I want to give you a particularly warm welcome and express the hope that you are back here many times uh, in the future. The Boston Foundation is Greater Boston's Community Foundation, a 104-year-old charity that has cumulatively invested over $2 billion in Boston area nonprofit organizations engaged in a wide variety of work. But fully a billion of that $2 billion has happened in just the last 10 years. So we have a philanthropic scene here that is robust, this, one of the strongest infrastructures of nonprofit organizations anywhere in the country, and we're very proud to be part of that uh, ecosystem. Uh, in addition to uh, uh, stewarding uh, charitable funds and grant making, the foundation does like to make itself periodically into a forum like this where challenges and issues facing the community are explored uh, in some depth with great expertise uh, and data. And this morning's topic is one of great uh, and current uh, importance. Uh, I always think when the, the issue is immigration and we're talking about it that uh, it's literally true that there would be no Boston Foundation were it not for the historic immigration that occurred in this country between 1880 and 1920 when cities like Boston uh, doubled and tripled in size, the country industrialized very rapidly, the, the doors uh, of immigration were thrown wide open. It was a remarkable, remarkable period, but one uh, of great stress and wrenching change uh, as well as uh, opportunity. And uh, community foundations were invented, the first one being in Cleveland, we came shortly after, were invented to try to use philanthropy in a more strategic way uh, to take on the big issues of, uh, uh, of the day. So we feel squarely in our, in our zone uh, this morning, uh, having the pleasure of hosting this forum on the growing wave of federal immigration uh, restrictions. Uh, immigration is in the news uh, a great deal, but of course it has many aspects and it can be very difficult to f uh, follow or to have the right context for any particular uh, uh, event that is occurring. Uh, so we thought this forum that would bring together a whole set of uh, uh, regulations and changes at the federal and examine their kind of reinforcing and commun com cumulative impact uh, would be a real service to the community and that's what we hope to do this morning uh, with the help typically of some tremendous uh, 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 expertise that will be part of the discussion. But the real pleasure I have uh, this morning is to introduce our, our, our next uh, uh, speaker. Um, the, uh, it reminded me, Mayor, of an of a, uh, uh, incident when um, we had just moved into uh, this, n this new space. And um, uh, you were uh, slated to uh, speak at uh, a big forum on uh, gender equity, uh, 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 payment equity, and you were late, and people couldn't believe it, given the mayor's commitment to the issue of gen gender equity. Uh, but it turned out he was uh, delayed because he was at a press conference on saving the DACA program. So uh, 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 this is familiar ground, we're happy to say, uh, for Mayor Walsh, and he is without question uh, a leading champion. Uh, of immigration uh, in this country, and we're so fortunate to have him at the helm of the city. Please welcome Mayor Walsh. Thank you, Paul, and, and I want to thank you and, and, and the board and the foundation for all that you do. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here this morning uh, for this important conversation that we're having. Uh, I want to thank the city leadership, the CM, Marty Martinez, uh, Chief of Health and Human Services is here, uh, Joyce Linehan, Chief of Policy is here, and I'm sure over the course of the morning other people will come in. Uh, I want to give a shout out, special shout out to my Office of Immigrant Advancement that's here. They're amazing. Uh, they do amazing work in, in the city. Uh, why don't you guys wave, stand up, whatever, who that is here. Just stand up. You can do the work. They were on the front line uh, every single day. Um, and, and in the last three years, or two, actually it's only been, believe it or not, two years and six months. Seems like 30, 300 years that we've had this 
government going on in Washington. Uh, they've done incredible work, um, amazing work on, on so many of the other issues. So I want to thank them for their tireless work. Um, you know, um, our country is definitely still at a crossroads, uh, but Boston is showing a way forward. I mean, we're going to continue to. Um, I can't tell you how proud I'm, I'm the work. I can't proud I am of all the work that's been done by a lot of people in this room and a lot of people in a lot of rooms around the city of Boston. Uh, thank you for that. It's a testament, I think, to our city's values. Uh, immigrants like my parents uh, and many of yours literally built the city. Paul talked about the growth of this city in the 30s, the 20s and 30s. Uh, that made a difference to who we are as a city uh, as immigrants came to these shores. Uh, there's been different times and periods of history where immigrants have come to the shores of Boston and other cities across America. Uh, and they, they truly are. When you look at, we, we, we're talking about, um, you know, the, the Community Preservation Act, we, we passed it uh, not too long ago. Uh, part of that money from the Community Preservation Act goes to historic preservation. If you go around the city of Boston and you look at all the historical sites, there's a good chance that most of them have, were built by the hands of immigrants that came to this country, that moved rock and rubble and, and, and did all the hard manual labor work to make those sites created. So we are, I, I am certainly somebody who has not forgotten the immigrant community and somebody that will never forget the immigrant community. Uh, for me, actually, it's a point of pride. I'm very excited, I'm very proud to say that I am first generation. Wherever I go, I talk about being the son of an immigrant. When I was campaigning this summer, last summer across Indiana and Ohio, uh, and Iowa, I started my speech by talking as a son of immigrants. I made a point to say I talked about that because this isn't something we can just say in Boston in the safety of our own city. It's something we need to take across the country and really talk about immigrants and the impacts immigrants have. Now it's our turn here to protect and empower those who've come here to seek a better life and, and also tell their story. Over the last few years, we've, the hits have just kept coming. We've had the travel ban. We, had the scare, we have the scare tactics every couple of weeks. Every time there's something goes on in Washington, there's another scare tactic that's thrown out across uh, the TV. Policies rooted in fear, bigotry, and hatred, and racism. It's counter to everything that we stand for as a country. And let's not forget that. Our country comes first, and there's been a lot of criticism of the country. It's, it's about the person who is putting this stuff out there. He does not stand for the values of the United States of America. And it's something that we have to continue to remember. But Boston's going to continue to fight back. We're going to show us, show people who we really are. One of the most important steps that we've taken is the Legal Defense Fund. We saw a dire need. We came up with a real solution. We pooled our resources and raised over a million dollars in our first year. And I want to thank all of the people who stepped up. I'm going to read some of the names of the first folks that stepped up. The Boston Foundation. The Himes Foundation. The Barr Foundation. The Klaman Family Foundation, the Fish Foundation, the Miller Foundation, Foley Hoag. Those were the first people that stepped up to help us raise a million dollars. The Defense Fund has allowed us to protect and defend and serve our immigrant and refugee community. We know when immigrants have representation, they win 62% of their cases. So it's so important for people to have representation. When they don't have representation, they win 10% of the time. We are meeting a very important need, and we're working together to continue that. The funds we have raised support five legal service organizations, six community-based organizations, and partners in Greater Boston. This results in hiring six additional immigration attorneys and eight community advocates to support our immigrants. More than 300 legal cases have been opened. 43% of those cases have full representation. These clients represent 33 different countries of origin. A very, another pretty impressive number. More than 4,300 people were educated in You Know Your Rights Workshop, another training that our office and other folks have done to go out there and explain people their rights. This work that we're doing is about keeping families together. It's about protecting kids and children. It's about keeping our workforce strong. This work has a big impact, and we're going to continue to work together to make this program even stronger. Today, we're going to hear from some great partners this fund has supported. They can tell you more about what they're up against and what they need to keep moving forward. We'll also discuss the new Boston Indicators Report. 
Andre Lima from the city and Trevor Matos from the Boston Foundation will be explaining those will be explaining those findings. <clears throat> They'll talk about the major changes the Trump administration has made and wants to make in policies, like DACA, like TPS, like asylum and refugee programs, and public charge. Here's what we know for sure. <clears throat> the Defense Fund is working and it's helping people. We want to continue to expand this program. The city is dedicating $50,000 for year three, putting our stake in the game. And we need your help. Many of you have been supportive since the beginning and hope will continue to work in this space. If you haven't gotten involved yet, now it's time. The Trump administration is not backing down, and I'm not using this as a scare tactic. We need to work harder now more than ever to protect human rights. There are many ways you can help support this program. You can talk to Marty Martinez, who's here, Chief Marty Martinez from Health Human Services, who's here with us. You can also donate. We want to ask you that are here today, go back to your employers. Ask them to get involved. Tell them I'm asking them to get involved. Because the people that lead companies here in Boston are probably immigrants themselves or one or two, one boat ride away from, be, or plane ride away from being an immigrant themselves, first generation or second generation. Their family came from somewhere. And when their family came here from somewhere, there was probably a good chance that they weren't greeted at the airport with a sign, Welcome to America. They were probably said, We don't want you here. So we want to be able to raise this money and continue to move forward. We've already shown how effective this work is when we work together. All of us are a part of a strong advocacy community that change can happen. Here's just one more example. More than 8,000 foreign trained health professionals live in Massachusetts. 8,000 people from another country are here in Massachusetts that are doctors and nurses. More than 20% of them are unemployed or working in non-medical positions. Oftentimes it's because getting licensed here in the United States is difficult. This is something that we, want, we wanted to fix for a long time. Thanks to many of you here, we're starting to get move, move, move along forward a little bit. This year, the State Senate's budget includes the formation of a commission that will try to remove these barriers. This is a big step, and I want to thank you, everyone who continues to speak out on this issue. And this is one issue of many where people come to this country that have a degree in different types of professions in their country, and when they come to the United States of America, we don't acknowledge, we don't recognize their degree. So this is one space that would be really important to us. We want to keep replicating this program, the success. We want to continue to move forward. We need to keep working together. We need to keep celebrating the contributions of our immigrant community. We can't let the conversations that are happening around Washington get us down, because we are better than that here in the city of Boston. In that spirit, uh, before I before we move forward, I just want to thank you all for being here this morning. Thank you for this part, this important conversation. I want to thank the panelists that are going to be speaking. And again, I want to thank the Boston Foundation for once again hosting this very important conversation. Well, all right. Thank you so much, Mayor Walsh, for your continuous support for Boston's immigrants who truly do make our city great. My name is Trevor Matos, and I am the research manager here at Boston Indicators. And I'm going to be sharing a little bit about the work that we've done on, this, on these immigration issues. Uh, I'd like to start off just by offering my sincere thanks to the Greater Boston Immigrant Defense Fund for the work that they've done and for their partnership. Um, and I'd also like to recognize the grassroots strategy team here at the foundation um, for bringing us all together to begin with. And one quick shout out also to my colleague, Peter Churchick, who's done a great deal of work on this project. We really appreciate those contributions. So I'm just gonna dive right into the research and, and focus on the key findings here. And then I'm gonna turn it over about halfway through to my colleague, Andre Lima, with the city of Boston, who's gonna bring us out uh, through the rest of the research. So one of the first big moves that the Trump administration made was on DACA, or Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. And this is a program that the Obama administration made back in 2012 through an executive action in order to provide temporary legal status and also work authorization 
for previously undocumented immigrants who arrived to the U.S. as children. And so this is a really important program, but it was also vulnerable because of the way that the Obama administration established it through executive order and not through law. And so, of course, the Trump administration seized on this and almost immediately announced the end of this program. Thankfully, the court stepped in and at least for the time being kept this program alive, but they are no longer accepting new applications. They're only doing renewals. And even this is sort of uncertain how long that's going to continue. And with respect to the renewal request, there's also been a significant impact in, in getting back to Mayor Walsh's comments through the fear that has come from that original announcement. And this is what we're going to see on this next slide. So after the Trump administration announced the end of DACA in 2017, renewals across the country fell by 70%. That's a key example of the way the administration uses fear to the detriment of our communities. And this is also played out right here in Massachusetts. Here in Mass, we have more than 6,000 DACA recipients, but we also have almost 11,000 people that are eligible for DACA and they can't obtain that status thanks to the Trump administration. So now, as the legal proceedings continue and the courts ultimately determine what's to come of DACA, we have in Massachusetts 17,000 people that are either DACA recipients or DACA eligible whose lives are just left there hanging in the balance. People that have often lived most of their lives here in Massachusetts or in the US. They've grown up here and this is really their home. They now have families and jobs and homes, and these are the people that the Trump administration has chosen to target. But they didn't stop there, of course. More recently, the administration turned their attention to temporary protected status. And this is a program that was created for people from countries where a natural disaster or political instability prevented their safe return home. And so the way that it works is the Department of Homeland Security will create this designation for a period of 18 months and they'll offer, similar to DACA, temporary legal status and work authorization. And then after the 18 month period, they'll reconsider the conditions in that country and decide, okay, can these folks get home safely now or do we need to extend this designation so that they can remain here in the US and continue working? And so, of course, the Trump administration turned their attention to TPS and decided to end that status for six different countries, despite the fact that the conditions in those countries really had not improved. And this is what we see on the next slide. In the top half, you see the six countries, and you also see the header that their status has in fact been extended by the courts. And this is because TPS holders came together and filed legal action against the federal government, citing the safety concerns if they were to return home, and they even were alleging racial bias on behalf of the administration. And the courts gave them the nod and sort of, at least for the time being, maintained their status through 2020. So we're still awaiting a final resolution there, um, but these people at least have until 2020. Meanwhile, when we take a look here in the local context, we see that we have more than 12,000 TPS holders here in Massachusetts. Most of them are from El Salvador and Haiti. And this is relevant because even though we think of TPS, per the name, as being a temporary program, El Salvador and Haiti have had TPS continuously for 10 to 20 years. So these people have been, you know, contributing members of our communities. They've been living here continuously. They often live in mixed status households with U.S. citizen kids. They own businesses. They own homes. And these are the people the Trump administration wants to push out. But even beyond DACA and TPS, perhaps the biggest and most impactful restrictions have come through our humanitarian protection programs, the refugee and asylum programs that were created through the 1980 Refugee Act. And both of these programs serve the global refugee population, people that fled their home countries for fear of violence or persecution, but they work in sort of a complementary fashion where the refugee program serves those that are abroad. They've fled their home country, but now they're seeking resettlement from somewhere else in the world. Whereas the asylum program, it serves people that have either made it to our borders 
or they're within the United States. And the nice thing about the humanitarian protection programs is that unlike DACA and TPS, being temporary status programs, they do offer a pathway to citizenship for these really particularly vulnerable people that have fled their homes. But the humanitarian programs also give an enormous amount of authority to the executive branch, particularly to the president, in terms of how to operate these programs. And unsurprisingly, the Trump administration also took advantage of this. And this is what we see on this next slide. Probably the single most impactful restriction to come out of the Trump administration was to lower refugee admissions to the lowest level since the inception of the refugee admissions program. At a time when global refugees have now swelled to a population of 20 million people, the Trump administration said, okay, let's take 20,000. Just an incredible decision there. And this is also playing out here in Massachusetts, where we see since the Trump administration took office, refugee admissions to our state fell by 86%. And of course, they continued and took their focus to the asylum system. And similar to the global refugee population, the number of asylum cases has been on the rise. And this is what we see next. Since 2010, the number of asylum cases has increased 500%. And what has the Trump administration done? They've undermined the asylum system, first, by making victims of domestic and gang violence ineligible for asylum protections. This came through former Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Of course, it was overturned, but it still had an impact. Next, they attempted to implement a total asylum ban for border crossers. And it's important to keep in mind that People that are coming to seek asylum protections are often fleeing for their lives. And so asylum law establishes that you can make your claim on US land regardless of how you enter the country. So this was contrary to asylum law to begin with. Next, probably the most cruel and impactful restriction that came from the administration was separating the thousands of children from their parents at the border that were coming to seek protection and putting them in detention facilities and causing an incredible amount of trauma. And notably, some of these kids still haven't even been reunited with their families today. Most recently, the Trump administration has worked to keep asylum seekers out of the United States altogether so that they can't even get to make their claim. And then when they finally do get a chance to make their claim, the wait in Mexico policy is forcing them to remain in Mexican border towns that are relatively unstable to begin with. And what we're seeing is really a developing humanitarian crisis with thousands of people getting backlogged at the border. And this is what we see right here on this next slide. This comes from an Associated Press uh, article that did some deep cover research down at the border and found that there are now thousands and thousands of people that are stacked up living out of tents without access to basic necessities in really precarious conditions. And I think this just paints a really um, poignant picture of the way that, you know, we oftentimes get abstracted into our data and our policies and all of those complexities, but at the end of the day, we're talking about human beings. We're talking about families and we're talking about kids that are just trying to come and have a better life for, the, for themselves and for their future. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Andre Lima, who's gonna walk us through some rule and procedure changes, and then thankfully offer us a little bit of hope in terms of what we can do right here in Massachusetts to better support our immigrant community. Thanks, Trevor. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Andre Lima. I'm the Policy and Research Director for the Mayor's Office of Health and Human Services. And I'm gonna walk us through a procedural change that the Trump administration is attempting to make to what's called the public charge grounds of inadmissibility. 
There's a long-standing provision in the Immigration and Nationality Act that can disqualify immigrants uh, from either entering the country or obtaining a green card if they're likely to become what's called a public charge, uh, which is a term used by U.S. immigration officials to refer to an individual that is considered primarily dependent on the government for subsistence. So when an immigration officer reviews an individual's application for a green card, um, they apply what's called the public charge test, uh, which is meant to determine whether the applicant is likely to become uh, dependent on the government in the future. And in this sense, it's a prospective test. And it's within their, their discretion to deny the application uh, if they deem the ap applicant likely to become a public charge. And in making this determination, there's uh, many parts of an individual's application that an immigration officer can consider. Uh, age, health, family status, education, and skills. But for the purposes of this presentation, I want to focus on one particular aspect of an applicant's uh, application that an immigration officer can consider when applying the public charge test, and that is the use of public benefits. Currently, immigration officials may consider the use of programs on the left when deciding whether someone is likely to become a public charge. However, in October, on October 10th of 2018, the Department of Homeland Security published a proposed new rule that would broaden the definition of a public charge to include a use of a wider range of public benefits programs, including absolutely critical nutrition and health programs like SNAP and some public health insurance. Those are, some of those are listed on the right. Now, there's one immediate concern, which is that people may be denied a green card because of their use of certain public benefits, and if they're unable to adjust their immigration status, their current status would eventually lapse and they would become deportable. Now, this is worrisome and cruel, but I just want to zoom out for a moment uh, to focus on the broader implications of this proposed rule. Based on our experience with past immigration reforms and policies that specifically target immigrant communities, it's reasonable to expect, and we're already receiving anecdotal evidence from community partners to attest to this, it's reasonable to expect, ex expect that the proposed change will discourage immigrants from accessing health, nutrition, and social services, regardless of whether or not they would be directly impacted by the rule change. This is what we call the, a chilling effect. And just to give you a sense of scale, this chart shows the estimated chilled population of Massachusetts, which is defined here as the number of people who live in a family comprised of at least one non-citizen and have received food, health, or housing benefits. As you can see, about half a million people in Massachusetts, many of them U.S. citizen children of immigrants, might be negatively impacted as families choose to disenroll from critical programs for fear that they might put themselves at risk by continuing to use them. And I'll just mention briefly as a final point that large-scale disenrollment from health programs represents a real public health risk because when people discontinue treatment for chronic and infectious diseases, the health of whole communities, that means towns, cities, and states, uh, can be endangered. Now, in addition to these changes to the public charge rule, there are a handful of additional procedural changes to and restrictions on legal immigration uh, that the Trump administration has attempted to make, and those are detailed in the report. But I want to close this section of the presentation by talking briefly about how cities and states can work to better support their immigrant communities. Such local actions include allowing undocumented students to pay in-state tuition at public institutions of higher learning, and helping foreign trained professionals navigate the state credentialing system so that they can work in the fields of their specialty. We can also support immigrants by helping them navigate the legal, the legal system. Because immigration law is civil, not criminal, Immigrants in deportation proceedings are not afforded an, afford an attorney if they cannot afford them it themselves. As a result, many people go unrepresented in immigration court or have to represent themselves. And unsurprisingly, a person is much, much more likely to win their case if they have a lawyer. And in many cases, this means winning some form of immigration relief for which they qualify. In fact, immigrants in Massachusetts are six times more likely to win a deportation case if they have legal representation. So as you can see, a representation in immigration court is absolutely critical, and access to legal representation is a real obstacle. So I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Nair Torres, from the Himes Foundation, who's going to talk a little bit more about what we're doing locally to fill this gap.
Thank you, Jennifer and Andre, for that timely report presentation. On behalf of the Greater Boston Immigrant Defense Fund and the Himes Foundation, it's really been an honor to partner with the Boston Indicators and the Boston Foundation on this critical resource for the field. 2017 ushered in a new federal administration, which took swift and alarming administrative actions that threatened the rights and well-being of our immigrant communities. In response, a funder gathering was held here at the Boston Foundation in partnership with Philanthropy Massachusetts and a number of local funders to help build awareness of the nature of these threats, how our nonprofit and public partners were responding, and what philanthropy could do to rise to the occasion. As today's report highlighted, a number of efforts were catalyzed in response. In this morning's panel, you will hear from partners advancing one of these efforts, the Greater Boston Immigrant Defense Fund, a public-private partnership launched by Mayor Walsh in partnership with the Massachusetts Legal Assistance Corporation and the Massachusetts Law Reform Institute with support from local and national funders. Since its launch in fall of 2017, the fund's partners have worked to bring together direct legal aid with community outreach and organizing to build our region's capacity to protect and defend immigrant rights here in the Commonwealth, an effort made all the more critical in this climate of ever-shifting and increasingly hostile federal policy. Our panelists will share more of that story with you today. It is my honor now to introduce our esteemed moderator, Marcela Garcia, editorial writer for the Boston Globe, who will lead our panel discussion. As the first Latina ever to serve on the Boston Globe editorial board, Marcela has brought her expert bilingual journalism and nuanced perspective to immigration policy and other issues of concern to the Latino community. I can think of no one better to lead this timely discussion. Please join me in welcoming Marcela to the stage and our panelists to come take their seats. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nayid. That was a very, very kind introduction. And thank you to the Boston Foundation for hosting this important discussion this morning. I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists here, but um, you should know that there are bios, more extensive bios for them in your program. Um, first, we have uh, Meg Moran, who is a staff attorney with the Greater Boston Legal Services, Gladys Vega, executive director of the Chelsea Collaborative, Michael Ravi, who is the director of data and policy analysis at the Massachusetts Legal Assistance Corporation and Iris Gomez, senior staff attorney with the Massachusetts Law Reform Institute. So let's just dive into it. Um, I wanted to begin with a question for both Meg and Edie's, and feel free to, to jump if you guys also have um, points to make. But I wanted to ask, um, because you're directly doing legal aid work, um, you know, with the support of this immigrant fund, can you tell us how that work that you're providing to the immigrant community, how has that been shaped by this shifting policy landscape that we heard described um, in the report? So feel free to. Um, okay, I guess I'll start. Um, I would say our work has been shaped in every possible way by the shifting landscape. Um, at Greater Boston Legal Services, we, we represent low-income people in the greater Boston area in a variety, all, all types of civil, non-criminal matters, including housing, elder law, family law, employment matters, and such, and also in, our, in my area, in immigration. Um, and since this administration took office, I really can't, and started to pass the policies it's passed, and I can't think of a case that I have, any clients that I have that haven't been impacted by the policy. So um, maybe I can just give a couple of examples. Sure. Um, it used to be the case that when someone came into the country to seek asylum at a port of entry, uh, they would be given an opportunity to express their reason for fear in their home country and why they need protection in our country. And if an asylum officer in that initial screening determined that they indeed had legitimate fear and probably a basis for going forward on an asylum case, 
they would be um, allowed to come into the country and wait for their opportunity to have their case heard more fully by uh, an immigration judge. About two weeks after President Trump was inaugurated, we started seeing a new policy where people were not being released after a finding of their credible fear, but instead were being incarcerated. And my first encounter with that was a couple from a country in Central Africa who had been persecuted. And she had been tortured by government officers, and it was an extreme case of persecution. And they were both placed in different uh, prisons here in the Boston area. She spoke only her uh, tribal language, and so having an interpreter for her was very difficult. She was completely isolated in the prison facility by her language limitations, and also traumatized in the presence of uniformed people because of what she just escaped. A prison, the prison medical staff determined that she was being re-traumatized in the prison and then, in fact, she had a complete psychotic break. So our policy caused her more harm. And we, we appealed to ICE to let her out under these circumstances, arguing that she posed no danger to the community and she wasn't a flight risk because she wanted her moment to seek asylum. And she, uh, we were refused. And the ICE officer who was responsible for her case said he, he was surprised because it looked like the kind of case that should go forward with a release. Um, they ultimately received asylum, but the suffering that they went through for that process was intense. And that's not an isolated case. Mm -hmm. That's one example, though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, another example I'm having right now is a woman who, in the past, she came into the country uh, fleeing uh, forced prostitution and other severe persecution. Uh, in, in the past, if she had come to the attention of ICE officers, she would have been um, given a notice to appear in immigration court, um, and she would have probably come to our office or some other legal services organization, talked about her situation, we would have developed her case, we would have worked with her over time, and then presented her case to the court. Instead, what happened to her is when she, she came to the attention of ICE in one of these um, situations where someone has a reason to go into a Massachusetts court, um, a Massachusetts state court, uh, in her case it was because she was charged with assault. But the person she's charged with assaulting is the person who trafficked her into the country. She's a victim of sex trafficking and then repeatedly raped and abused her. So in the context of what has happened to her. Of course, she shouldn't be charged mm -hmm. with assault. Um, but in any event, she had all this fear of going to uh, any kind of authorities because she'd been warned that in this climate that could cause her to be deported. So she ended up, when she went to Massachusetts State Court for <coughs> her criminal matter to answer her criminal charge and try to have it resolved, she, before she even got into the courtroom, was apprehended by ICE. Mm -hmm. Because she never made it into the courtroom, she has no, no appointed defense counsel in her criminal matter, and so she's been detained for months now, not, unable to be transported to court because ICE won't release right. her to state mm -hmm. custody. And she has two children um, who are preschool age, who are US citizens. As soon as she was taken into custody, her abuser, the trafficker, who's the father of one of her children, filed for custody and obtained custody of the child. So like the trauma to her and to her family just keeps reverberating. And so uh, that, that's just an example. Of, so she's in detention, so her case becomes much more complicated yeah. because everything, uh, this administration is prioritizing all, all cases of people in detention. Um, they're often saying that the reason they're doing doing that is because these are people who have committed crimes and it's for our public safety, for our, our welfare, the community's welfare. But what we're seeing is it's really just a more expeditious way to, de to deport people. Because what happens once someone's in detention, and so you see like the example I gave, she's truly not a danger to the community. 
but she's being treated as though she is. She wasn't, she wasn't detained on the assault charge, so the police and the community don't consider her a threat to the community, but she is in detention solely for purposes of her uh, over, visa overstay and because she's undocumented. So in, in that case, what happens is we have a very limited amount of time to prepare her case, and it's very difficult. She's an hour and a half mm. from Boston now. So every time I go to meet her, it takes three hours. It's, it becomes a much more difficult case. Also, it's not just an immigration case now. She has concerns about the welfare of her child, so we've been involving family law attorneys mm. as well. Her, um, the man who is her alleged victim also threatened her partner saying if he took any steps against him, he would report him to ICE. So now we're trying to work with the Attorney General's office and the Civil Rights Division. So it becomes a much larger case each time we represent somebody. Those are just a couple of examples, and I don't want to take any more time, but I, I think what we're seeing is that there's much more enforcement, and then in addition to the challenges that more enforcement brings, we have much more complicated... More barriers. More cases because... Mm -hmm because people who wouldn't have been under, uh, detained or placed in removal proceedings are now being placed in mm -hmm. removal proceedings. Um, Iris, anything you want to add? Yes, I just want to connect what Meg is saying, which is so critical to showing the difference a lawyer makes and also the increased cost for legal services that this administration has imposed, because now attorneys have to do a greater, deeper dive into many areas of a client's case that perhaps they didn't have to before. But um, I wanted to connect back to the, um, the areas of policy change that the um, report highlighted, which I think did a very nice job for you guys of breaking down and bucketing some of the areas of policy change. But what I wanted to address is that um, the, at the macro level, the policy change has been extraordinary. It's been um, virtually, the mayor said, every other week we were getting something. In fact, that is the case. Um, Senator Markey has a, a list of all of the policy changes footnoted um, over the last two and a half years, and I counted over 30 policy changes in all of these areas and more. So not only the attorneys, but the community groups, all 13 of the GBIDF um, grantees have been besieged by immigrant families who are affected by multiple policies. So you heard Meg talking about the asylum changes, but our TPS and our DACA families also have um, opportunities that are being closed off to seek asylum. Some of them are persecution victims too. Um, many of them have U.S. citizen children, and, and when they run into hard times, they need to access housing, and they need to access um, health care programs, and they are being chilled from accessing those programs and nourishing their families and taking care of their families' health out of the fear that has been generated and that the community groups have had to respond to as well. So it's the the pace and the scope of policy change that has really changed the ball game here. Mm -hmm. So, um, Gladys, uh, let me turn to you now. So at Chelsea Collaborative, you've been at the front lines working with the community for years, you know, pre-Trump, and now, obviously, with all these challenges and barriers thrown at the immigrant community. Can you tell us how has your organization approached this, you know, barrage of policy changes, and what are you seeing um, in terms of what the immigrant community's needs are and what are you doing to support it? Like, how, how is it working at the ground level? So I have to say that, um, first, I am grateful for the establishment of the fund because since the election of this administration, the community of Chelsea went into lots of tears. I never thought that publicly I would shed so many tears with members of our community because of the fear of ICE in our community, on TV, on the courts, um, in, in the sense of loss and, ho and, and hopelessness. There was no hope. It, was, um, it has been one of, those, um, one of those situations where if people don't come to our office, we have to be innovative and we go out to them. 
So for example, for example, when we think about what makes America great again, for me, is what we have here. A group of people working together to address the issue of inhumane policies that keep attacking families, that keep separating families. And what we have done in Chelsea has been a little bit different. So for example, as you were talking about you know, the legal partners and all the workloads and the cases and the increase of cases, in our community, what we have also have is victims are afraid of going to court. They're undocumented. They have an ICE agent in the Chelsea court system. We are sanctuary city. In 2007, we became sanctuary. So immigration was unheard of. Like immigration agents in our city, there's no way. We have an amazing um, city manager, Tom Brozino. We have a chief of police who has been like the, 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 the exemplary mm -hmm. chief in terms of community policing and working with undocumented families and, and stuff and the superintendent. So we have all that covered. We have earned the trust. But here comes, you know, ICE agents to our court. So what happens is people are afraid of going to court. Victims of crime, witness of crimes. People are not speaking about what they see or what they hear um, because they're afraid. We had a situation recently that, I'm, that I want to make sure that um, it doesn't get sort of like reported, but in, in terms of, because it's under investigation still, but 167 families um, went to this church. They were you know, members of a Christian church. They um, wanted to buy a, a building for the church. They put together approximately what they thought it was $97,000. It happened to be 140000 And every, um, every month they would give for the temple. And then every Sunday they would um, be offerings too to maintain the church. So to maintain the rental unit that they were renting as they were getting the building. So what happens? The pastor disappeared. Well, the, the parishioners began to ask questions to the pastor. What is the bank balance? When are we getting the church? Have you talked to the landlord where we are now? Um, he's putting the, this building for sale. Can we make an offer? I think we close to 100,000. One of the treasurers says, you know, I'm only collecting money, but I don't see any financial statements. I don't see anything. I'm a community person, but my name is being used. So two of them came to the Chelsea Collaborative, and one of them in particular was afraid of approaching me. So what we decided to do with my board president, who happens to be a detective of Mexican descent um, from the Chelsea um, Police Department. So she said, Gladys, if people are not coming to us, and if we know that this is a, a, a large church, let's go to them. So we said, you know what? You and I are trusted members of the community. I'm going to take this case on my own, although I run the organization, and we're going to knock on doors. And we're going to ask these parishioners, these people, to speak up and to tell us what, what is happening. Because they were afraid of going to court. They were afraid of pressing charges. So when we approached the district attorney under the Rachel Rawlings administration, she gave us two DAs. On a Sunday, on two consecutive Sundays, we went out to our neighborhoods. We knock on those doors. His, Don Jesus and other members of the church gave us a list of people that they knew they had given money. So they had given $140,000 for the temple, $65,000 of offering for almost two and a half years. The remaining balance of those two accounts is $43 in one of the accounts and $23 on the other account. Their church money has gone, disappeared. The pastor has also disappeared. He happens to be we, we know that he's somewhere in Escondido, California, which in Spanish, Escondido means hidden. <laughs> so, so he's hiding in Escondido, California. Um, and we're waiting, <laughs> and we're waiting now to extradite him. But the, the, the worst thing about this is that we did everything very innovative, not going to court because people were so fearful about going to court, about being faced with ICE agents. So what we did is what we know best knock on doors, get our community together, meet at a place where people feel comfortable at, and use our partners, our legal partners. Because I tell you, without legal partners, we have no community, we have no access to justice. And that is why I'm grateful that we, together, everyone here, the Boston Foundation, the Boston Immigrant Defense Fund, 
Heinz Foundation and Miller Foundation, all these partners really, they get this stuff. And this is why um, this case has been a little bit successful. I cannot say that it's yet success because we haven't brought them in and most of the money has been gone. Um, but at least people spoke up, at least people are doing something about it. So going back to the fund, let's talk uh, about the, the fund and, and how it, it actually works. Um, Gladys and Meg, can you guys talk a little bit about, I mean, you were talking about the importance of legal partners, right? You guys have a, a collaboration. Can you talk a little bit about how that works in supporting immigrants and you know, what does that collaboration sure. look like? Yeah, you want to? We at um, Greater Boston Legal Services, as is true of the other legal service providers who are reci re recipients of the, of the fund money, we, um, we have a presence with our community partners, particularly with um, Chelsea Collaborative. We go there to meet people who need legal um, services for their intakes. So we go into the community, um, and into the communities, in this case in Chelsea, and we, um, we talk to people there in an environment where they're comfortable and don't feel fear of coming forward. Um, for many people, even coming to our office is, mm -hmm. is challenging. Uh, so we meet people and then um, it provides an opportunity for us to have support within the community because as I was trying to illustrate earlier by the examples I offered, the. The, these cases are not just immigration law cases. They affect whole family units and whole communities, and, and including US citizen children often. So we need the support and the coordination with our community partners. But it makes it possible for us to um, save some time in identifying clients through the, the partnership. And also, it, each of the cases that I'm working on now of people who are in detention are people that I. I learned of, through one of our community partners, the need for legal representation for people in every aspect of immigration is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. If it's especially so for cases in detention, and we just can't screen everybody who's in detention. And if you go to the hallway at the immigration court and you see the list of cases before the immigration judges each week, there's everyone's attorney is listed. And if you look at the detained cases, almost it's very few people have lawyers. So it's, it's a real crisis. So we rely on um, the Chelsea Collaborative and other organizations in the fund to help us become aware of the people who are in most need who are in detention and at risk of being deported. Can I ask you to clarify something? I mm -hmm. mean, maybe this is just me. Um, um, in, in, I don't want you to get into the weeds or anything, but there is an in you know, an increasing amount of people in detention. Mm -hmm. Why is that? I mean, it wasn't the case before, right? Mm -hmm. And so, because there's been a systematic effort at detaining people and make them more eligible for deportation faster, is that, the, is that why they end up in detention faster? Or what is the sort of underlying? I think I know. One of the first executive orders that um, our president signed was an executive order that changed the uh, priorities for for uh, removal, mm -hmm. and consequently eliminated priorities. In the past, under the prior administration, in theory at least, and in <coughs> largely in practice, uh, individuals with significant criminal histories were the priority, and the elimination of those standards meant that everybody is eligible, is for, detention. eligible for detention. And so what we're seeing is this criminalization of immigrants, Absolutely, correct? absolutely. Which is what's driving some of uh, these policies. I have a, a woman I just went to an ICE check-in with. She came into the country. She, it was like her third or fourth attempt to come into the country. She's so desperate to escape certain death. She's a victim of persecution. Um, but each time she came in, she was not given an opportunity, contrary to our law and international treaties we're party to. She was not given an opportunity to express her fear and to say why she needed asylum. She's now being tra treated like a criminal entrant because of her repeat attempts to enter. She had a baby soon after she entered the country. She got an ICE instruction after a few months later to come with airline tickets to the Burlington office. And that's when we met her. Mm. And I went, I called the ICE officer ahead of time and said, 
she needs to be given a screening to seek asylum. She's asking for a screening to seek asylum, and she's entitled to that. She's tried five or six times. Now you need to do it. And he said, no, she's, if she wants that, she's going to have to go into detention. We're going to detain her. I said, well, she has a breastfeeding baby. And he said, well, she can't hide behind that baby. So I ended up going to the check-in with her, and we negotiated, and they didn't take her into detention, but it just illust illustrates the point that she's being treated as though she's a criminal mm -hmm. when she's really here just to seek asylum. Mm -hmm. And she's asking for right. the screening. She's not trying to hide from the process. Mm -hmm. The reason they want to put her in detention is because detention is a priority, yeah. so they can move her along more quickly. The case moves faster, moves faster. towards deportation. But yeah. that's an example of right. it being used for purposes of de deportation. Right. And so also when you're, when you're seeing part of the report that you will see if you, when you read it and is important is that it's not just these new policies on DACA or TPS or um, asylum that we're talking about here, we're also talking about people going through the ordinary process of adjusting to, to permanent residence and to applying for citizenship now. Even where you're doing everything right. There's a fraud commission mm -hmm. now that's the pur purpose, their, their, their raison d'etre is to figure out some way to deny mm -hmm. status. Right. So, so people who have been here and have already gotten some kind of status are also at risk and then can right. end up in removal proceedings. Right. I mean, you're example also illustrates the uh, importance and significance of having a legal advocate and, and, and legal help again. Um, so Michael, let me um, turn again to the fund. So your organization, the Massachusetts Legal Assistance Corporation, has been charged with managing this fund and, and monitoring its impact. So can you share with us what are you seeing in terms of early outcomes from fund partners and, and how has have the fund's coordinated approach to legal aid you know, in turn have had an impact in the individuals who are being served. Certainly. Um, before I jump on that, mm -hmm. um, I'd like to just tell folks who may not know that much about legal services, sure. like what legal services is. I, I think there's a lot of new faces in the room. And uh, so in Massachusetts, legal services is made up of a network of uh, nonprofit legal aid offices. They are spread all around the Commonwealth and they cover the entire Commonwealth. Uh, they're all independent, and <clears throat> the legal aid offices that are part of this project are located on, in the sort of the eastern half of Massachusetts. So this, this project, the Greater Boston Immigration Defense Fund, is able, ha had sufficient funding to uh, staff up legal aid offices as well as community organizations sort of in the eastern half. Uh, there is a significant immigration population in the western half of Massachusetts that is also going uh, uh, maybe underserved. Mm -hmm. I, th I think it's, uh, the, the numbers are pretty astounding that, that uh, how underserved this population is when you look at the what's going on in the court. Um, so uh, so this, this particular project, uh, uh, MLAC, which is a uh, uh, an entity through which funding flows to those legal aid offices. So we are the primary source of funding for uh, most legal aid in Massachusetts. And this particular project uh, funding, the funding comes from a collaborative of funding sources, uh, mostly local, but also some national collaborative funding sources, which is a somewhat unique effort by funders. And we are very am amazed by it. Uh, and we pass those funds on through uh, the, and, and, and administer it. On top of that, we also do all the data collection and management, uh, and this has been a great opportunity for the legal aid offices to really study uh, with some significant data collection efforts uh, just who we're serving and what's happening to them. So your question, which was uh, sort of on the outcomes mm -hmm. and impacts of the work. Uh, so one, uh, one of the things that we tried to do was develop data points on uh, legal outcomes or legal accomplishments. A special challenge to this project, though, was that <coughs> these immigration cases take forever. Mm. It can take two years, three years. 
And if we're going to wait till the end of the case to tell our funders what's gone on, you're not going to know. <laughs> you're not going to know. <laughs> uh, but uh, what is also very true about immigration practice is that the minute you get a lawyer, um, <coughs> The, the good results start flowing at the beginning and in the middle and not just at the end. Mm -hmm. And so we, we studied uh, outcomes or accomplishments during the course of the case as well as what the situation is at the end of the case. On every, everybody's chair, there's a, uh, we call it a two-pager, it's really four pages back and front, uh, with uh, lots of information uh, that has been collected through the, uh, uh, the, the, the funded programs and the community organizations. On, on outcomes, though, you'll see we tracked a lot of pot, what, we, what we characterized as positive outcomes. We think that's important to know. What are the, what's the good things that are happening as a result of this work? <clears throat> uh, there's nearly 700 positive outcomes for the uh, 304 cases that have been open so far. And, <clears throat> and that is, um, uh, I think, pretty, pretty substantial. It includes things like deportations having been prevented, deportations having been delayed, uh, that uh, individuals with no legal status gained legal status through the advocacy that they received, uh, or people with legal status that was threatened were able to preserve that legal status. These are critically important things. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, on the issue of detention, uh, significant numbers of our clients have been released from detention as a result of the advocacy that they received here. Uh, <clears throat> another uh, accomplishment that we paid a lot of attention to were uh, not so much legal outcomes, but welfare outcomes. Uh, and so we looked at, uh, during the course of the case, did the did the client uh, uh, experience an improvement in their financial circumstances? Uh, was their family reunified or was family unity preserved? Uh, things like that we paid uh, close attention to. And the, you'll see in the papers uh, that, that have been handed out uh, that there have been some very, very significant results um, on, the, on the outcome side. Mm -hmm. And the second part of your question had to do with uh, uh, how, the, how this model has worked. So you can imagine uh, uh, a half a dozen local funders all wanting to individually grant funding and support this kind of work, and a national funder with its own wishes regarding funding, and all these legal aid offices and all these community organizations wanting to try to access this funding. The logistics of trying to connect those funders with the funding, uh, with the grantees, is not. <laughs> yeah, you can. Everybody's nodding. It really is not a, a good option. And mm. MLAC is really perfectly positioned because we've been around for 35 plus years, uh, administering funding for legal aid programs, uh, collecting data on the, the work of legal aid programs, and so these collaboratives with their vision, speak to us and say, this is what we want to do. Uh, can you handle the funding part? Can you give us the data that we need mm -hmm. uh, to measure uh, the effectiveness of, of our support? And, um, and we can do that. And that gives all the legal aid offices a single point of contact. Mm -hmm. They deal with us, the community organizations, they deal with us. And uh, hopefully that's a good experience. Yeah. Um, so just a quick follow-up. You mentioned Western Massachusetts yes. and that part of the state, and we obviously tend to be very, very Boston-centric here, or greater <laughs> Boston-centric. But I think that's a really good point that we shouldn't really forget about. Um, can you tell us or give us a picture of what's happening there? Why is it being underserved? What can we do to you know, direct more help there in terms of legal aid and, and the fund? Well, um, More money, obviously, <laughs> but you know, I, that. I, I mean, it is a very short answer. Sure. It, it really is a matter of when it comes to delivering legal services. Now, I think, I think in the indicator's report, there's mentioned that the average case costs about $5,000. Yep. Um, so far, our research and the cost associated with our work were around $1,800 a case. So mm -hmm. we're a good deal. But, we're also, <laughs> but we also, um, 
But I think it's for a very good reason. We're really good at it. You know, there sure. are th yes. th these, no, yeah. these legal aid sure. folks and, and these community organizers really know what they're doing and, um, uh, and they bring to bear, I feel like I'm going off on a tangent here, but they bring to bear um, the full menu of sure. legal aid. Mm. So within this, this network alone, I think there was nearly a thousand referrals within the network that were made to each other. Now, you, you see that we opened 304 cases, so what was happening to those other mm -hmm. referrals? Well, what was happening to those other referrals, those people were getting help in the domestic violence unit with their domestic violence case, or in their healthcare unit with their health issue cases. You know, there, there's just this tremendous menu of sure. resources. So out in Western Mass, I think it's, it's really a, a question of having uh, sufficient resources mm -hmm. I think, I think the Greater Boston Immigration Defense Fund funders, that collaborative, would have loved to have seen wall-to-wall -wall statewide support mm -hmm. for immigrant defense. Uh, but when we looked at the reality of the amount of funding available, when you spread it a little too thin, it starts to lose its effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was the, the concern. So we, we would love sure. to be able to beef it up. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to throw a question to all of you, and feel free to jump in or, um, you know, with, with your answers. Let's talk about emerging, emerging threats. What do you see as the next sort of, you know, cruel policy coming, or, or things that we need to be paying attention to in this coming year? Um, you know, that we should be prepared of as as an advocate community and, and for the fund, and and also, um, what advice do you have for funders who are seeking ways to support? our immigrant communities in responding to this emerging threats? Uh, can I start? Sure. Uh, because there's a, an imminent threat. Um, I don't know if people have heard about something called the housing and urban development uh, rule. Mm -hmm. But um, in uh, the federal housing program, Section 8 Public Housing, there's been a rule for many years that allowed um, families that included those who were eligible for federal housing and those who are not eligible for federal housing, which could be people with TPS or DACA, not just undocumented people, but uh, where there were other family members who have um, uh, citizenship or a green card or some other status that qualifies them to live together and have the ineligible household members pay their share. And you know that in a city like this and a state like Massachusetts where housing, affordable housing is such a precious resource, it is important for people to be able to remain in their homes who um, have access to them. And so um, the, the proposed rule would evict mixed status families, no longer permit this arrangement of paying your, your share anymore. Uh, this will have a tremendously negative impact, not just on these families, but on our city, on our communities. How are we going to respond to that? So the very first thing is to submit public comments opposing this rule that are due by July 9th. Uh, I encourage everyone, uh, if you want to contact me, there are uh, other resources. I'm sure the city is leading an effort to respond. The housing authorities are appalled. It's a very expensive proposition for them to round up all of their tenants mm -hmm. and start evicting them. Um, it's just an extraordinary rule. So that is one significant threat looming that I urge everyone to get involved in. Any other? Gladys sure. Go. I would say, so first I would, just to answer some other stuff on deportations that you were mentioning. Yeah. I actually think that there, the reason why we keep sort of like keeping people in detention centers because they have costs. Everyone there has an individual cost and we need to keep someone who's rich, wealthier. <laughs> and, and I actually think that that contributes to that. I also have to say that um, in terms of solutions, I actually think that we cannot always blame the horrible administration that is in the White House. We also have to take responsibility for what we have not 
done in Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, we have not passed an immigration policy yet that reflects the needs of the community. We haven't passed a driver's license. We haven't done a state in-state tuition. So I think that I think that we cannot ignore the fact that we have to do our own stuff in our own state, the same way that each city is doing a little bit more when it comes to being a sanctuary city, when it comes to sort of like convincing police officers that blend the families do assist and that we're not, everyone is not a criminal when they're undocumented. So I really think that I would be remiss if I lose the opportunity to say that together we need to do more for Massachusetts because we are better than mm -hmm. what we have in the White House. And we cannot um, continue to sort of like blame everyone out there when we have choices in front of us that we are not um, addressing. And the choice is to call our governor, Baker, to have him sign in to the um, driver's license bill to do in-state tuition. At least two things. We haven't done anything for 30 years, and that wasn't Trump. So I just have to say that. Well, I, <laughs> I appreciate it saying that. Um, and I'll add something else, uh, just to add a little bit of context to your, to your very, you know, very you know, important comments, is that you know, I've, I've been here for close to 20 years, and I've been working as a journalist for more than 10. And for, for 10 years, I've watched the driver's license bill go in and out of the state house without no action whatsoever. 10 years, at least. You can look it up. Yeah. And same with in-state tuition, and this obviously predates Trump. This bill has not even received a hearing yet at yeah. the state house. It's still sitting there. The governor has said he's not he's going to veto it. But the legislature has an opportunity to, you know, not only make a statement but but change the lives of many many immigrants <clears throat> here in Massachusetts. The driver's license bill is a hugely important um, piece of legislation and yes, we need legal aid we got to face all these emerging threats, but this is something tangible that would change the life of many immigrants. It would, would literally give them the chance to do their jobs. And so it's baffling to me. I totally share your outrage because, again, that bill has languished in the legislature for not for two, three, four years, for l nearly t 10 years. And right now it hasn't even ha has a hearing date. So I think that your point is very well taken. Other states have done, and New York is about to do this, the driver's license um, for undocumented. So we, we, there's no way we, you know, there's no reason why we shouldn't do it. So I appreciate your comments, and I hope everyone is going to go home and call your legislators immediately. <laughs> this, this is a type of thing that needs advocacy, right? You know, it's, it's one thing to say that we all support it, we all get behind it, but we need to do our part. So going back to the, yeah, <laughs> sorry, and I, have, and I just have to say, and we have to do that, you know why? Because Boston and Massachusetts, we're better than what we have in Washington, D.C., and we represent the best. So we got to do something about it. So going back to the emerging threats, uh, Meg, do you, you know, want to add something? I, I do. Um, I think one, I mean, it, it's hard to even say what's emerging because all of this has been a progression from sure. the beginning. It, it's like here. It's here. It's happening. So family separation is still happening. We met with someone this week who's trying to have her seven-year-old release who's who has a neurological disability, severely disabled child, in a juvenile center um, at the border. So what's happening at the border is in our communities. Mm -hmm. It's not far away. Yeah. And she's trying to reunite with her uh, seven-year-old child. She's being treated as though she's an unfit mother and having to go through all sorts of um, ordeal with our, our system under circumstances that don't warrant it at all. That we have this idea that people coming primarily from Central American countries are just coming for a better way of life. And you know, anyone wants to shadow me for a day, mm. will, will it, for those of you who don't already know from your own work experience and life experience, we're seeing people who are fleeing extreme violence that's not criminality. It's discrimination, it's persecution, it's targeted violence a lot of which our government had a, a role in establishing in our past involvement in those countries. Um, so these are very complicated situations and each country has its own unique history. And, and so I guess what I'm saying about the emerging, emerging threat is that it's still happening. So was it 100,000 people last month trying to come? We, mm -hmm. have this, 
We keep saying there's an emerging humanitarian crisis at the border. It's not emerging. It's happening. Yeah. And meanwhile, we are becoming more draconian mm -hmm. and horrific yeah. in our response. And so it's affecting the character, the soul of our community life and our country in a way that happens. I'm seeing across the board there are many very nice, helpful civil servants involved in Department of Homeland Security and the Immigration Court, but they are constrained as well. Sure. So the woman I told you about who's who's got the two children, mm -hmm. who's in detention, you know, she was she was handed an asylum application by the judge and told, fill this out, complete it in, in a week, we'll consider your case. This was before we met her. The application's in English. She doesn't speak English. There were no translation services available. So she was one week away from being deported mm. when we met her. So this is this is this is causing people in the in the in the system to behave in ways that are yep. not good. Yeah. <laughs> that are not good. So anyway, the emerging threat, there's a lot of pressure on the immigration judges, there's a lot of pressure mm -hmm. on the asylum officers and the other USCIS officers mm -hmm. to to deny people and to move them out. I, I have to just mention real quickly that also another emerging threat is that people take advantage of the fear of immigration. Oh, so yeah. there's a lot of fraud happening in our communities. People are afraid of speaking out, so sure. they become victims of crimes because they're not reporting those crimes. So we have to be extremely careful with that in terms of our legal experts and our legal um, partners um, to make sure that when we do our workshops and, and that we talk about those issues too. That, that they're being prayed that, on. Yeah, yes. So, uh, sorry, go ahead, Michael. Oh, mm -hmm. So I, I would just also add that uh, we heard in the indicators report about the uh, 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 public charge issues. Yeah. Uh, it that that is not law today. Right. Right. It could become law mm -hmm. soon. Yeah. And uh, and it will be a complicated law, no matter what it it comes out as. And the threats uh, to the health of immigrants and the communities that mm -hmm. they live in is very real, as was mentioned. I think that that is uh, something that is an emerging threat that we okay. really have to pay close attention to. Uh, there will be uh, similarly a, an economic threat sure. that is going to be borne by, uh, by this immigrant community. Uh, poverty is going to explode uh, if if uh, the public charge rules uh, have their effect. So uh, what funders can do and what legal aid programs can do and what community organizations uh, do sort of in their soul is educate the community about what, what's real, what's not real, yep. what you can do, what you can't do. And, uh, and a lot of this is uh, uh, stuff that can be litigated successfully. Sure. But so there's, a, there's room for lawyers to make a difference in that work. Okay. Uh, whatever's gonna happen with DACA is, that is going to emerge in a big way when it sure. happens. And, and TPS, TPS mm -hmm. I mean, you saw, you saw January 2020 is not that far away. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Less, than half, uh, less than six months. These are really months. big, these are really big communities of people with uh, very deep roots uh, that uh, is going to be super uh, yeah. disrupted here in Massachusetts. So, um, so before we turn to the uh, questions from the audience, the indicators report outline solutions like Gladys mentioned one of it is uh, advocating for a driver's licenses for undocumented immigrants. Any other policy or solution that you guys want to highlight before we turn to the um, audience for questions? The in-state tuition of course but any other? Well um, Gladys didn't mention but also there's been some systemic advocacy in the courts not just nationally yes. but locally and some of the GBIDF grantees are critical leaders in that, and one of those initiatives is the um, uh, lawsuit challenging the presence of ICE in Massachusetts mm -hmm. courts, uh, which is really important um, if, if we can make uh, inroads into that. So I guess this is sort of to echo what Michael is saying about um, we need to invest in, in this, this kind of a project, or I, I urge funders to invest in this project, both to provide the services to the individuals, but also to support this systemic impact that would affect thousands of people if we could get a victory like that. Yes. All right, now let's um, 
go to the audience for questions. Um, I should remind you, there's people with microphones. And if you have a question for um, Trevor or Andre, who presented the uh, report, you should feel free to also post a question to them. Oh, here we go. And if you can introduce yourself as you pose the question, that would be great. Hi. Can you? Yeah. I'm Carmen Plazas, and I have a question um, well, who, for anybody who can uh, speak to this. But if you could please speak a little bit about uh, the Venezuela TPS bills that have been introduced both in the Congress and in the Senate, um, having both support from Democrats and Republicans, but being not discussed at all by the administration, even though they are publicly saying that they understand the humanitarian crisis. Um, also a point to, to refer to is that Venezuela is now number one on asylum seekers, but at the same time, it's not getting any type of support from the administration. Thank you. Does anybody want to speak to that? Yeah. Not. We're, we're not really involved, but um, I just, you know, as you may have heard, um, the uh, Dream and Promise Act finally passed the House uh, yesterday. this week, yesterday, mm -hmm. yeah. So, mm -hmm. and, and that is a bill that has had bipartisan support for so long, at least on the, the DACA front, and, you know, we still don't have, we still don't have that law. So, you know, I, I, I assume that, you know, the challenges to some of the other bills that you're talking about are e equally, if not more severe, yeah. Yes. Hi, I'm Adam Bastam. I run an organization called Reimagining Migration. And so I'm wondering, are any of you involved with large-scale educational um, support systems. There's a new report out of UCLA that suggests that uh, that administrators around the country are just baffled by all of the changes that have been thrown out at the beginning of the report. And people are actually, you know, they don't know what to do for their kids. Increasing amounts of their time is actually, forget negotiating the academic and uh, social and emotional work, it's actually negotiating the legal challenges that their kids have had. So are any of you involved in helping educators so they have a good sense of what their rights are, what their responsibilities or obligations? Mm -hmm. And piece two is I saw a really wonderful model, and I wonder if there is such a thing here. UCLA just started a legal clinic for one of their community schools, so it's actually a legal on-site legal clinic for the students. So I'm wondering, does such a thing exist mm -hmm. anywhere here? Yes, so I, I can give a few th examples. So one of the grantees um, has developed a partnership with the public schools, and so they've done a lot of education of the teachers at that school about these changes because um, the, the teachers are often in a position to translate the information <laughs> better than sometimes the, the legal team. Uh, but I think other, other grantees are also involved in similar efforts. Yes. yes, we have done the same with the school superintendents. So they, the teachers have been trained, we have had forums, we have had workshops. We even work with our local clinics, health cl care clinics, where there was a huge St. Rose. St. Rose is a Catholic church mm -hmm. where over 1,500 members go every Sunday. So they had a huge festival back in March, and we brought doctors from Children's Hospital, um, Julia, who's an incredible occur, who's an incredible advocate, who's always in these um, forums with us, um, and MGH doctors, Dr. Atkins, they all came to this um, fair basically to tell people individually, I am a doctor. They came with their suits, and they say, I am a doctor. If you don't have access to health care because you're afraid, to come to the hospital, we'll go to your home. So it was incredible and very unique to have healthcare providers provide access to them in that setting, but it was basically so to deal with the fear, and it's the fear that, you know, please do not, if you don't keep your appointments, let us know because we'll go out to your home. Um, and with the school system, we've been working very, very hard. 
um, in addressing the issue of not sharing information of the school department being a sanctuary city. Our school committee passed a resolution, so we've been at it from the beginning. Um, and thank God that we have been very successful. Uh, there are um, legal um, immigration lawyers working at universities in the area to oh, help yeah. students. Um, that's true. That's um, very established. BU, right? Harvard mm -hmm. does. BU Harvard does. Yeah. I'm I'm mm -hmm. sure that Tufts does as well. So yeah. there is that. At the university level, or like we're at the K-12 level. Oh, I'm talking about yeah, yeah undergrads and yeah. So in but the other organizations, I think the lawyers for civil rights. Um, Mm -hmm. They they are very very involved with the, the the VPS system in terms of supporting not just teachers but but the community. I mean, at VPS, more than forty percent of the students are Latino, and many many are immigrants, recent immigrants. The so attorney general's office has been too. also mm -hmm. giving a lot of guidance, guidance to the school right. administrators. Yeah. Uh, you have a question there. Yes, I'm Alex Perry. I'm part of the Somerville uh, Sanctuary City Steering Committee. Um, I, I will just throw in, I hate to give away a resource, but the Harvard Immigration Refugee Clinic has been very helpful for mm -hmm. us yes. coming out and working in the community, going to churches, going to community groups, mm -hmm. bringing lawyers and law students to help with things. Um, I just want to express my deep appreciation for everybody in the panel. Um, and I want to shout out for Maggie Morgan from Greater Boston Legal Services, who has been a brick. <laughs> and, I guess my question for the panel is, these are individual cases. Each person is attached to a family. So I was wondering if you could speak to some of the issues that surround this per person who is detained, whose family has lost a breadwinner, who has all other kinds of resource issues. Anyone want to tackle that? Uh, I mean, the, isn't there um, a statistic that, um, what is it, that uh, a case involves how many 3.5 family members or 2.5? I forgot. Well, the average uh, legal aid family size is around three to four, three or four. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, pe people. And, um, and I don't think we reported household sizes mm -hmm. in the data that we re uh, released for this. Uh, but those families also, or that, that particular immigrant it usually presents with multiple immigration problems, mm -hmm. two, three immigration problems. So, so uh, the cases are compl complex. And I have to add that, um, that although we're talking here about immigration, when we deport one, that bread earner, we're left behind with a huge amount of problems mm -hmm. that we need to address as the nonprofit organization who's addressing the needs we have to figure out how this family is going to pay for the high cost of rent. We have to figure out how they're doing with food. How are the kids are going to make it back to school? How are their, you know, their their families are sort of like going to function without the the, the father or that bread earner? So I think that you know, although although immigration is that so important integral part, right, of the subject matter. I mean. The fact that when you deport or when the, or the, the fact that when you're dealing with immigration issue, it's horrible in terms of the, the family composition, what the family composition goes through sure. and the fear of having to have access to anything. Because right now, you know, many of these policies that uh, the administration has proposed, nothing really has happened. They're like crazy policies that he thinks and tweets, right? But the, the problem is that with the respect of you, Marcella, as, as, as the journalist, is that it, it, goes to the, it goes to the news, right? And everyone in, in Chelsea know, that's, is yeah. like that's so afraid. That's a very afraid. important no, point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everyone is like, oh, this is happening, and then the line is that, and then you have Facebook, and everyone it goes to social media, and we have to sort of like be alleviating the fear and saying, nothing has happened here, guys. You can go to the hospital, you can go to court, you can do this. I mean, the fact that you, the fact that we did this lawsuit with um, civil um, lawyers, civil, for, lawyers civil. for civil liberties, um, and Rachel Rollins and, and the DA Ryan and the public defenders group, it was amazing. You know why? Because since we did the lawsuit, 
I have reporters inside the court system in Chelsea. We haven't had an agent. So, I mean, <laughs> I've been, we've been so fortunate that at, at least we have kept them out of Chelsea for now. It doesn't mean that they're not going to come back. But I think that, you know, when we use our legal experts and we use the, the you know, the lawsuits and stuff, that really works and at least it slows the process. Yeah. And that's what we need to do. Yes. Can, can I just add also uh, about the families? This is another way in which this type of project is different than um, when funders fund a community group to give food to families who are in need or um, funds a legal services organization to provide legal services. It's one thing. But this collaborative is a really unique model that matches the community partners to the, um, to the lawyers. And so it, it, it's better equipped to respond to the collective needs of the families. And so, for example, you mentioned you're from a faith-based organization. We have uh, faith-based community groups in the, in the fund. And so they have been able to supply, like Chelsea Collaborative, for uh, the, the human needs of the family members who are left when, when the mom is in detention or the dad's in detention and also have provided other kinds of um, supports, you know, accompanying um, the families to their immigration proceedings. So that model of collaborative services wrap around a family in a really effective way. Yes. Um, what we're seeing too is that um, in many cases, maybe all of them, but many that I can think of off the top of my head, because people have been afraid to come out from in this climate, um, once we meet someone who's in removal proceedings and we start to uh, become acquainted with their family members, then we there are more cases that come out of that family that are, I mean, Michael was referring to this as well. So at Greater Boston Legal Services, what, for example, what we're seeing is that our, we need a, a um, this administration is calling on as much expertise as can be mustered in immigration <laughs> law, but it's yeah. also calling on, and we call on, our colleagues in all of the other units. Mm. So every case seems to end up involving, um, you know, yesterday I was meeting with a family law unit about a case I'm working. So, so all of our cases in, involve uh, lawyers from other areas of law to support the issues that come up when somebody gets involved in removal proceedings or in the immigration system. Also, the, the organizations are raising a lot of money for bond. So yeah. when we can get a bond, it's you know, set, it's thousands of dollars, and most families can't afford to pay that. Yeah. And so m these organizations um, and our coordinators, so we will call you know, our partners and say, we've got somebody we think we can get out on bond, but we need some we need to raise five or seven thousand yeah. dollars for that person in order for it to happen, and that can help keep the family intact and on an even keel through the removal proceedings, at least, if we can do that. Yeah. One, um, so let's go over. Oh, sorry. Well, I just wanted to add that one, one of the values of the funding collaborative was very much uh, an interest in building a network mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is not siloed, is a network. People are going to talk to each other. Uh, and so we tracked a lot of that data, and mm -hmm. we saw a tremendous amount of referrals going on just within the network, a tremendous amount of referrals going out of mm -hmm. the network into other community organizations. Uh, we saw uh, a significant amount of collaboration. That would be working together on a project, you know, doing a presentation, doing a training, doing a case. Lots of collaboration, one group and another group working together. And another very interesting thing that I thought uh, that we tracked was technical support. Uh, this little band of Greater Boston Immigration Defense Fund grantees have provided technical support to 137 other organizations on immigration matters. Mm -hmm. So it's a resource that has been being leveraged to create more capacity mm -hmm. in other organizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, the data has been very, uh, uh, I don't know, heartwarming to yeah. see uh, mm. that, and, and to the extent funders, and I know that I know funders really do care about seeing uh, uh, the building of networks yeah. 
uh, and I know the city really cared about that because uh, Andre talked to me a lot about it. Uh, <laughs> sure. Uh, we we uh, we're very glad to report that. Okay. Um, yeah, over there in the back. Uh, Steve Michelson. I'm a clinical psychologist, so I'm listening to your presentation of incredible information in a different way. As a mandated reporter, if I saw abuse occurring in a family or in an institution, I would have the right and, and mandated to report what's going on. You referenced fear, trauma, and we've seen the decisions and provisions and um, some of the behavior of the people in the cabinet who have implemented these terrible uh, decisions. Is there a process that is in place and has it been, not from a legal point of view, held these people accountable from, for the trauma they've imposed? Let's just take children and their families and not everybody, but is there a process in place to hold these people for the trauma they've imposed on thousands of people? I guess the short answer is no. Well, <laughs> I mean, it's really, it's true. It, it really I, I get a couple of thoughts in response to that. There are, there's national litigation going on. There's, yeah. Um, yes, and, um, you know, particularly with respect to what's been happening with the children. And there have been some officers who've been um, singled out for abuse. I, I think also, um, you know, we, we, uh, we try to communicate as often as possible with um, DHS and mm -hmm. ICE officers um, to call out situations that we think are egregious and hopefully what happens over, we see over time is that sometimes it matters. But yeah, I think, I think that's part of the problem here is, and part of the emerging threat is that immigrants in our community feel like, are being made to feel like they're asking they're asking something of us um, when they're not really. They're they're working. They're it's providing. Right. And you know, someone in my office a couple of days ago, the wife of someone who's in detention, was thanking me for being nice to immigrants, and it was just so awful. Because why would someone feel like they need to say thank you for it? Like it's just it's a complete. So no, no, you know, <laughs> people are traumatized by the tenor of our public discourse as well as the individual mistreatment that they have. Yeah. Um, over there. Hi, I was wondering in part of your coalition how you're working with cultural partners, arts organizations, and the libraries because when we were doing outreach for HIV AIDS work, we did non-traditional partners like hairdressers and things to get information out. I was wondering if you have them in your coalition. If not, I'm going to tap Carmen again because she's at the State Arts Council. And they've been doing work with EBT card holders and people in DCF and how cultural spaces are safe spaces. And a lot of our artists would be happy to step up and a lot of our artists are in this community. So I was wondering if that has been in a conversation about expanding your network. I, so sincerely on the arts, is that what you're saying in yeah. terms of, yeah. Um, so we haven't, but I would love to talk to you about it. And if I can help, let me know. Yes. OK. Uh, so let's go over here. Uh, good morning, and thank you for this. This is so critical. Uh, my question has to do with uh, many of you know that Massachusetts would have lost population in the last census. It had it not been for the, in this case, Hispanic Latino demographic. And the implications, I don't know how much the general public understands how that could affect everybody, natural born, native, I don't care where you're from, if you live in Massachusetts or the United States, it has a huge impact on everyone. Given what's happening with the Supreme Court vis-a-vis -vis the Trump administration's uh, request to put citizenship on the U.S. Census. Whatever happens, my concern is no matter what happens, even if they support the administration's request, the reverberations for residents who are here legally, they themselves may in fact be afraid. 
to fill out the census form. So the undercount will not only affect Hispanics, it will affect everyone. So can you comment on where we are with that education? What, what can we do? Sure. So we've been part of, um, in the past 18 months, the Chelsea Collaborative and a group of Boston-based nonprofit organizations have, with funders and access strategy has been instrumental in sort of like creating this fund. We've been talking about it and we've been organizing around it. Um, and we actually have different cities having their census kickoff. Our kickoff, for example, is June 22nd, where we're doing the kickoff of the census just as an outreach type of um, sort of like fiesta and festival on Broadway, Chelsea, just to highlight that need for people to respond to the census and how to um, teach people that if they were to, um, that there are consequences if any of the office of the census office would share the information. I think that we're doing it exactly one year in advance. Mm -hmm. I mean, on April 1st, with, with Mayor Walsh at the, at the Boston Library, we held our press conference, in East Boston um, Library, we held the press conference to basically said, a year from now, we will be doing the census. So we, we are very aware of that, and that is why we're doing everything in advance to educate our community, but the fear is there, it's real, and, mm. and the loss of funding for the state of Massachusetts would be devastating yeah, if, if we do mm -hmm. not. And I'm telling you, funders, it would be worse for you guys because I'll be knocking on your door. <laughs> 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 Give me money because there's no way we're going to be able to do it with less. It's right. been hard. Um, so we have time for one uh, question, last question. Unfortunately, I want to throw it to Mr. Grogan here. Do you have a question? Thank you, and it is a resource question. Uh, there have been frequent references to different sources of funding for aspects of your work, but could, could you characterize the overall picture? Are you overwhelmed by need that you can't meet? Uh, are resources pretty adequate? Can someone give me some sense of what, what the overall funding situation is if you were to aggregate all these different pots? Well, why don't I just start with the yeah, boring sure. information yeah. that is that the, <laughs> yeah. that, the, that the numbers of requests for help vastly uh, outstrip the yeah. ability to provide help. So it's, it's a long, uh, difficult decision-making process to decide who's going to get representation, who is not going to get representation. Um, and uh, you know, we, we opened 304 cases. I think the statistics were eight. Yeah. 8,000 mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, undocumented people in Massachusetts. So uh, we have uh, a, an overwhelming demand and need for, for additional services. At um, Greater Boston Legal Services, for the whole program, three, I think it's three of five people are turned away. In immigration, I think it's a higher unit. Three out of five, yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah. Yes. Three yeah. out of five people. Yeah. And I think in immigration, it's a much higher number. It's um, you know, it's, I would, it's the hardest part of our work, really. Mm -hmm. I, I just, uh, yeah. you know, every, there are, it makes such a big difference. Mm -hmm. it, it, it makes such a big difference for someone to have an attorney um, in so many ways. And, and even if we're not successful, we can, ultimately, we can have, we can then appeal. There's things that we can do to, to keep it alive yeah. and mm -hmm. to keep their case alive and to keep their situation as stable as possible. So, um, but it's <clears throat> it's not. It's it, we're completely overwhelmed. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, I would I would have to add that if the if the immig Boston Immigration Defense Fund would have no money for attorneys, I Gladys Vega, who's always begging for money, would not even accept a donation with, because without legal defense, our work cannot be done. There's no way that we can do this work without our partners, mm -hmm. without our lawyers. I mean, when we win, it's because we have legal representation. If not, we're not able to win. And what we are able to basically do is hide people in our community, but they, someone's going to catch up to them, and they're going to be yeah. gone. Yeah. So, well, with that, I want to thank you for participating with your insight and expertise. Thank you so much. Let's give it up for our panelists. And 
I would like now to welcome Marty Martinez uh, to give closing remarks. He's the Chief of Health and Human Services at the City of Boston and the highest ranking Latino in the Walsh administration. Thank you, Marty. Uh, so thank you, uh, Marcela and the panel. Um, you know, each time I've come to these events and sort of at the end, um, I have like a million things I'm thinking about for the panel and um, I'm always uh, going through my head. And I just, again, want to appreciate and thank you for all the work that you all are doing on the legal side, community-based side, uh, but most importantly, giving voice to the issues that we need to continue to give voice for. So once again, a round of applause for the panel. You know, I think part of the role for me here is, again, to thank folks, to thank folks for the work that we're doing and to remind us that uh, this work is really about, and, and, and taking a, something that Gladys said, um, it's about access to justice. Um, and that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about making sure that folks that are immigrants here um, into our communities um, have access to justice. Not only legal representation, which we know is critical in, in the different, it makes a huge difference, but also access to resources from community-based organizations, education, um, and ensuring that knowledge truly is power. Um, that's why we need to do the Know Your Rights workshops. That why, that's why the questions about what are we doing in our schools? How are we educating folks in our schools? How are we working with our police department? How are we working uh, across all the sectors that are here? And we have to continue to make sure we remember that this is about access to justice so that people have a pathway for those opportunities. Um, and again, there's so many folks doing important work here at the Boston Foundation, the Himes Foundation, all the funders to the fund who are making contributions. Without you, the collaboration that was here wouldn't happen. Um, I'm excited and proud that the city is able to make a $50,000 public contribution contribution um, to the fund. We'd love it to be more. There's no question. I'm going to say it, because if I don't say it, you're going to say it to me later. Um, <laughs> so we'd love it to be more. But that $50,000 in public funds are critically important. We want more municipalities, more city governments, more public entities to give public funds to what we're trying to do. It's an important part of this, and we hope it kickstarts uh, this next round of funding so that more funders can get involved and get engaged to be able to do that and to be able to support that. I not only want to thank those funders for their work, but there's individual folks that are doing important work. Um, I think the, there's Cairo Mendez. Is Cairo Mendez here? Um, Cairo Mendez for the Boston Foundation. Cairo's done a lot of work, not only on this event, but the fund as well. He's a DACA recipient, and I just want to thank you for all that you're doing here at the Boston Foundation to lift that up. So thank you for that, Cairo. When folks are thinking about contributing and volunteering, there's many ways to get involved. You can see the Boston Foundation, the Himes Foundation, to continue to think about that work. We also have our own, our, uh, from the city, Casey Brock Wilson, the Director of Strategic Partnerships, who's really helping to drive a lot of the work with our Moya office. So thank you, Casey, for the work that you're doing on the city level with us. I appreciate that. And I also just want to say that I think it's important that we think about uh, all the issues that are in front of us. We talked about emerging trends. We talked about um, things that are in front of us. I know that uh, this is being live streamed, I believe, uh, because I got a text of something somebody wanted me to make sure that I mentioned here at the end, which I think is important. And to not forget, some, a question was brought up about uh, not only the issues that are happening here today, but about our Venezuelan brothers and sisters and what they're experiencing. And to not forget that, that migration here um, with what's happening there requires us to move forward these TPS bills and to remember the needs that are there. And it just draws me to, to keep in mind that the issues that impact us here in our neighborhoods are impacted from all over the world. The challenges people face in their communities, the challenges that you know, my grandparents faced when they immigrated to this country uh, in an undocumented way to get here, not only fleeing difficult situations, but creating a pathway for opportunities for their families and for folks like myself. That's really what this work is about. And that's why we're trying to accomplish together as we work holistically. 
In closing, what I'll say to you is I think it's important to make sure that we lift up this conversation ongoing, not only when we're here at a forum, but not only when we're with other immigrant partners and providers, not only when we're advocating, but probably when we're not with people that think like we think. That's probably when it's most important to do that. When we want to tell the story that's out there, that's really what we need to do to break down the stigma and the fear that gets created. You know, someone asked about uh, teachers and schools, and we hear from teachers at the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Advancement and Health and Human Services, we hear from teachers in schools all the time who are dealing with families, trying to figure out what information to share with families so that students keep coming to school, so that parents access the resources they might need around health and services and other providers. Um, and we know it's about having conversation with folks, not just in the times when it's comfortable, but in the challenging times when it's there. So I leave you with two things. There are many ways to get involved at the end of the two slash four pager on the uh, Legal Defense Fund. There's ways to get involved on in that fund. I encourage you to do it. If you're a funder, I encourage you to talk to other funders because it's important to be able to do that. And last but not least, as a city official, I encourage you to keep pushing. I welcome all the work that we're doing in the city of Boston, and I'm proud to work in the Walsh administration as we continue to prioritize these issues. Can we do more? Yes. Can and should the city be pushed to do more? Yes. And I'm happy to have that engagement and pushing because we need to continue to lift up these resources to make sure we're making a difference and making sure there truly is access to justice. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day.